Hello, welcome to this Alchemist Chemistry A-Level video looking at Born Harbour Cycles. This is my second video in this series of videos on Born Harbour Cycles, and this was looking at a Born Harbour Cycle for Calcium Oxide. Before I start, if you'd like more of an introductory video looking into how Born Harbour Cycles work, some key definitions, and a simple example such as sodium chloride, please check out the card that will appear in this video. I'll take you straight to that video, give you an introduction before cracking into this example. With that done, let's go. The first thing I'm going to show you is how to complete this Born Harbour cycle by filling in equations on each of the lines for the various enthalpy changes taking place. Then I'll show you how to calculate the missing lattice enthalpy for calcium oxide. So I'm going to start in the bottom left hand corner with the enthalpy change of formation of calcium oxide. So I'll place the formula of calcium oxide on the baseline here, which is CaO solid. That's one mole of calcium oxide ionic compound, which is a giant ionic lattice structure. So the enthalpy change of formation is defined as being the enthalpy change for the formation of one mole of a ionic compound from its elements in their standard states under standard conditions. So here are my elements in their standard states. That is calcium solid because it's metal and a half O2 gas because oxygen is a diatomic molecule um, and also it is a simple command structure, therefore it's going to be in the gaseous state. So why have I written a half O2 rather than O2? It's Ca plus a half O2 because I need to supply one mole of calcium atoms and one mole of oxygen atoms to form the one-to-one -one ratio ionic compound calcium oxide, which contains one mole of calcium two plus ions and one mole of oxide two minus ions. So if I had written Ca plus O2, if I broke down a mole of oxygen molecules, that would actually provide two moles of oxygen atoms because it's O2. And that would be more oxygen than I need to produce my particular ionic compound with this particular formula and ratio of ions. So a half O2 is perfectly sufficient for this particular situation. So next we have the enthalpy change for the atomization of calcium. Now that's the enthalpy change for the formation of one mole of gaseous atoms from that element in its standard state. Standard state of calcium being solid, and so to change it into its gaseous state, I simply write the symbol G next, the state symbol G next to the calcium. So it's been changed from the solid state to the gaseous state. Next up is the enthalpy change of atomization of oxygen. That's just doing the same thing for the oxygen molecules, turn them into uh, gaseous oxygen atoms. So not molecules, but atoms now. So that would be CAG and OG. So now we have the atoms not bonded together conventionally as diatomic molecules, but as free singular gaseous atoms. Now on to the ion stage. So the first thing up is the first ionization energy, the enthalpy change for the removal of one mole of electrons from one mole of gaseous atoms to form one mole of plus one ions. So that's what this would look like. There is my one mole of electrons being stripped away to form my one mole of calcium plus one ions, and the oxygens have not yet done anything. Since ionization energy is a successive process, next up is the second ionization energy, which will remove yet another mole of electrons to form two plus calcium ions, like so. Two moles of electrons now removed, and calcium two plus ions have been formed. So you may have noticed that all of the enthalpy changes since formation are actually endothermic in nature. And that should make sense to you because atomization is converting elements from their standard state into the gaseous state. That's overcoming attractions and that's gonna require energy. Similarly, the first and second ionization energies are trying to remove electrons from the calcium atoms. That means putting in energy to overcome attractions between the electrons and the nucleus, which is positively charged. And therefore, again, it's going to require energy as an endothermic process. On the other hand, the first electron affinity is actually an exothermic process. That's because it represents the enthalpy change for the gaining of one mole of electrons to one mole of gaseous atoms to form one mole of minus one or one negative ions. That's forming attractions between electrons and positive nuclei. And that is going to be exothermic because making attractions or bonds is an exothermic process. Now, that process would look a bit like this. As you can see, the oxygen atoms have now gained one mole of electrons, forming O minus signs, and there's still a mole of electrons yet to be gained. On the other hand, 
the second electron affinity appears to be endothermic in nature. Now initially you might be scratching your head thinking, that's just weird. But actually it makes perfect sense. You're now trying to put an extra mole of electrons onto already negative oxide ions. There's going to be intrinsic repulsion between those negative species and therefore it's going to take more energy to force those electrons onto those negative oxide ions. You're trying to overcome those repulsive like charge forces that electrostatic repulsion. But if you apply enough energy, then you can get those electrons onto those oxide ions, forming oxygen two minus ions in the process. So we end up with our ions in the gaseous state and we're ready to do the lattice formation process. I'm gonna show you now how to apply Hess law to find the missing lattice enthalpy for calcium oxide. I've put onto this born harbor cycle all of the enthalpy changes that were missing for all of the various processes, but obviously we don't have the enthalpy change which is missing. I'm gonna show you a foolproof way of using Hess law to find this missing value. First thing is to define what Hess law is all about. Hess law states that the enthalpy change of a chemical reaction will be the same, independent of the route taken. So our direct route which we don't know the enthalpy change for, is in orange here, and that's the lattice enthalpy of calcium oxide. We can take an indirect route via all of these various enthalpy change processes, and ultimately route two, which we're going to take, will get us to the same destination, which is the formation of one mole of calcium oxide. So in theory, according to Hess law, this route we take will have the same enthalpy change as the second route we can't take, which is route one. So if we work out the enthalpy change of route two, it will tell us the exact enthalpy change of route one as well. Just a little note before we start. Some of the arrows of the route we're gonna take are gonna be going against the direction of the original energetics of the enthalpy change in question. That means we're doing the negative of that process or effectively the opposite energetics of that process. As I read through, I'm sure you'll notice that's happening. So the foolproof method is as follows. Put a start around the tail of the arrow you are looking for and a finish circle around the head of the arrow you're looking for. You're gonna start your journey working backwards from the start of your arrow you're looking for around the cycle, finishing at the head of the arrow, which is your finishing point. So we're gonna work our way around this cycle in this anti-clockwise direction from start to finish and find out the sum of all those enthalpy changes. Follow through it with me now. Our objective is to find the enthalpy change of route two shown by the green arrows. And effectively it will give us the same enthalpy change as that for route one according to Hess's law. So what I'd like to do is go round the cycle and have you follow around with me and hopefully it'll elucidate exactly what's going on. But effectively if our green arrow is going against the direction of travel of the original enthalpy change, it means the energetics of the process we're doing is also the opposite, i.e. it would be the negative of that process. So we're gonna do the opposite of the enthalpy change of second electron affinity. We're also gonna do the opposite of the enthalpy change and energetics of the first electron affinity. We're gonna be in the opposite of the energetics of the second ionization energy, the opposite of the energetics of the first ionization energy, the opposite of the energetics of the atomization of oxygen, the opposite of the energetics of the atomization of calcium, but actually we're going to do the same energetics as that for the enthalpy of formation because the R arrow is going in the same direction as the original enthalpy change arrow. So effectively, this is our sequence of events as we go anti-clockwise around this cycle, taking our green route two to find the missing enthalpy change for lattice enthalpy via Hess's law. Now let's bring in the actual values themselves, the numbers, and finish this calculation off. Remember, if our root direction arrow in green is going against the direction of the original enthalpy change, it means we're doing the opposite of the energetics of that process. For example, it would be minus the energetics of that process, whereas if they're going with the direction of travel of the energetics of that process, it will be plus the energetics of that process. So here we go. It's gonna be minus plus 845 minus minus 142 
minus plus 1150 minus plus 590 minus plus 248 minus plus 193 and finally because we're going with that final arrow of direction for the enthalpy change of formation it's going to be plus minus 635 so here is that working summarized and you can see that when we do the sum of all those processes i just discussed the overall enthalpy change for root 2 and therefore by via hess's law the enthalpy change for last enthalpy of um, calcium oxide is minus 3519 kilojoules per mole. So we've used Hess's law to solve that particular Born Harbor cycle problem we were posed. And it's quite satisfying because these can be quite big calculations and getting it right is really, really satisfying. Just before I take you through a quick proof to prove that this is most definitely the right answer, don't forget that if you found this video useful, please remember giving it a like, think about subscribing to the channel, maybe even ring the bell to get notified about latest content, I'm trying to put out videos on a weekly basis, and you can even think about sharing this video or the channel with friends, colleagues who are studying chemistry, and maybe it might help them as well, that'd be fantastic. I'm trying to spread the word as much as possible, and um, your support is always hugely appreciated, so thanks so much in advance. Keep you motivated to keep making videos on that weekly basis. Now, onto that proof. So that proof, the trick is, if Hess's law stands true, if you go full cycle round your Born Harbor cycle, you'll be taking away one root from the other. And if the two roots have the same magnitude or value, then taking one from the other will result in an answer of zero. So I wanted to show you on a calculator that this answer is most definitely correct by bringing it into the overall cycle and seeing what influence it has on it. And if we go full cycle, taking away this from the other root should result in a big fat nothing. Let's see. So in theory, if I go full cycle, take consideration my new value for root one, and taking away root two from root one, I should end up with absolute zero. So here we go. Wish me luck. Minus 845. Minus, minus 142, minus 1150, minus 590, minus 248, minus 193, plus, let's go with this arrow, minus 635, minus, our new number, which is minus 3519, because going against our final root one arrow. Drum roll, pre please. And moment of truth equals, woo, zero. Again, our cycle is correct, and there's our proof. Relief, we got it right. Hey, great work, guys. See you in the next one.